Welcome back to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Jeff Graham. Jeff is a hedge fund manager, an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School, and serves as a director for several public companies. Today, we're going to be discussing his book, Dear Chairman, Boardroom Battles and the Rise of Shareholder Activism. Jeff's an expert at activist investing, and in a past life, he was a rock star. Let's ask him five good questions. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Jeff Graham, author of Dear Chairman. Hey, Jeff, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. So let's jump right in. Uh, question number one, I've heard you previously interviewed um, on Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast in particular, and there was uh, I was really impressed with your thoughts around board governance and the dynamics of, of boards. Mm-hmm. I was wondering if you could share with us your opinions and on ways that boards can help management make better decisions, especially maybe around capital allocation. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. And, and like, I mean, if you're a director of a, of a small cap company, I mean, like that's often like your key role there is to help them on the capital allocation. And I mean, I don't know, like to me, like the first thing is that like you do often have to educate on things like, you know, uh, sh- uh, share repurchases, just like how they work. Yeah, you know, w- you know, like how the, like the math works on intrinsic value. But you know, like in some ways, like you have to back up and just like have that discussion of like what is the company worth. And like in a weird way, like when you, you know, we'll talk about like the major decisions that you make at the board level, and they're often, you know, should you buy back shares? Should you pay it, um, a dividend? Is it the right time to sell the company? Um, it's like you would think that that boards would have a good understanding of um, of the returns that you would get, like like from each uh, choice and from the kind of intrinsic value of the company, and they really don't. So, like to me, like it often begins with like like having that discussion that like often people don't want to have of like, hey, you know, what's this thing actually worth? Yeah, get some kind and, of a range established that everyone can kind of agree with and. Yeah, and, you know, well, sometimes, like, you, you know, like, you don't want to write that down, but it's, like, you need to kind of all be on the same page, like, like on that front. And you'd be surprised, like, how often they're not and and how often, you know, conversations that, that as an outside investor, you would think that right. all, you know, well, public company boards would have, like, they just, like, don't happen. And, um, you know, there's all, I mean... You know, often on a on a public company board, there's like the moment where you get interest from an outside party, and that's often it can be a distraction, but it's often a, a very constructive event because it drives all of these uh, conversations that that a lot of boards avoid. Right. It's, it's almost like here's the test showing up, and now now everyone's going to start doing their homework. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, so like your question is like in some ways based on a premise that there's like some basic understanding of the forces at play. And often like the first thing to do is like, just like to learn all that stuff. I mean, like you'd be surprised like how few people really understand uh, share repurchases, you know, and how they really work. So just going back to just the basics is the first step then. Yeah. It's like, I've been on multiple boards where, well, not multiple, you know, I've been on boards where people will, will like assume the, the purpose of a share repurchase is to support the stock. Yeah. And then there's like a vague notion of like returning capital to shareholders, but they don't really understand the mechanics of that. Or to and avoid it, option dilution or. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Yeah, that's, that's Grim. surprising, but it's also <laughs> kind of not that surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, it kind of goes back to me for Buffett's idea that, you know, you're a better businessman if you're an investor and a better investor if you're a businessman. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, I do think that like they really should like, like have a kind of a, a primer course on valuation, you know, for public company directors. I mean, like it really uh, drives a lot of decisions about your cash flows. And look, if you think about, you know, a capital allocation, there's only a few choices that you have, right? Right. There's like investing in the business, like pursuing M and A, dividends, you know, uh, repurchases, and so like it really can be deconstructed like into these discrete decisions, 
and there's a calculus to each of them and for each of those like decisions you know you know most boards aren't that equipped to do it like that I've seen hmm. so <clears throat> question number two the transition mm -hmm. here uh, I've heard Munger say that you could basically learn an entire MBA just from studying the life of GM uh, yeah and just with its rise, its fall, maybe it's come back. Um, could you walk us through some of your insights on it? As that was a, a, a pretty big chapter in your book, um, yeah. especially the Ross Perot era, uh, which I found completely fascinating. I mean, I remember Ross Perot during the elections, but I didn't really know that much about his uh, his business dealings. I mean, I knew that he had started a computer company and, and sold it, uh, but I'd kind of forgotten that he was part of GM and actually tried to fix it. And <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I had the exact same experience, right? Like, you know, I'm 41. The Ross Perot I know was the pro that, like, that, that ran for president. Yeah. And so, like, I really didn't uh, know this whole story until I did the book, and it was incredible. And, like, I really didn't know that much about GM. And, like, what ultimately happened is, as I tried to tell the Perot at GM story... I had to get the background and you can't get the background on a company, you know, like that, like without, you know, you know, going after the full picture. So, um, you know, so Munger's like totally right. It's like, it's crazy. Like, like how much in the business world, you know, will circles back to GM. Yeah. Like the history of the pension fund. Yeah. Like, you know, the history of shareholder activism, all these things like, you know, do, you know, will come back to, to GM in some way and like it would be an incredible business school course because if you think about how it became a powerhouse you know it began as this like a uh, conglomerate with a grab um, a, a grab bag of of, uh, of uh, small companies you know that Billy Durant put together and when Alfred Sloan took control of it he uh, basically you know, uh, turned it into a good operation by focusing on each division's return on invested capital. Right. He brought so, me measurement into the picture. Exactly. Like he really just began to focus on the, like on the metrics. And then he had this whole philosophy of, you know, a, a, you know, a fostering dissent, you know, that, you know, that you could do as like your, you know, two part course on like internal accounting and metrics and then uh, how to manage. And like that was all GM. It will, you know, it turned into um, like among the greatest companies in the history of the world. They, they helped the, the U.S. You know, win World War II. Um, and then it all went to hell, which is itself a whole business school course yeah. of, like, of, like of how do you take an incredible you know, a business you know, like that and completely F it up. And like it really, you know, turned into this like just horribly a frozen bureaucracy. And like there were like some signs that that could happen in the structure that like that Sloan uh, uh, created, like, you know, that really like de like depended on the force of his personality, like to keep all of these, you know, uh, committees like from not turning into monsters. And so it's completely fascinating. And then like you have like this like decline into horrible uh, bureaucracy and then, you know, Ross Perot getting involved and throwing a bunch of bombs into it like to try to get people to realize what was happening. So like it's well, pretty amazing. And like the whole Perot uh, pro stories, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, you know, kind of interpretations of his involvement. And, you know, there like are some people that like aren't, as pro pro as my book was and you know they just thought well like he was a troublemaker and he just like will raise like a lot of questions like without providing answers and he just will cause no problems but you know that company needed uh, someone in there to cause some problems you know for sure yeah you know so you know yeah like so that was like the most incredible tri you know chapter in the book to research and to write and i think it also like provided you know, like the turning point in the history. Like, I mean, I do believe that, you know, when GM bought a Ross Pro off the board for like for three quarters of a billion dollars, that that was this just, you know, real like, oh my God moment in corporate governance where you had all of these, you know, big pension funds, all these big institutions 
that had seen like the slow motion decline of GM. Like they had seen like the Nader, you know, like the like like the Corsair, you know, car that killed people. Yeah. You know, you know, when the whole like engineering department, you know, well knew that it was a bad design and they'd seen this kind of like slow uh decline in their operations. And then like for the company, you know, like to say, you know, like the best use of our like of our capital right now is like to overhaul our board of directors and to kick off the one guy that you all like the most. It's just like it, like it, like it forced like these big pension funds like to pay attention to governance, and so it, like it was you know like it was a real you know turning point in my book and in shareholder activism. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. So, question number three: Of all the stories that are in in your book, which one was your favorite to research? Oh uh, well, <laughs> if I can't say GM, <laughs> that just explained it. Um, I would say the Carla Scherer chapter. So that was, I think, the next uh, chapter, and that was the story of um, um, a woman, uh, Carla Scherer, um, who was the daughter of of the founder of a company called RP Share, which, uh, you know, they made the machines that make uh, gel caps. And her, her husband was the CEO, and she ultimately got uh, so upset with how that company was being run that uh, she uh, ran a proxy fight to fire him and to sell the company. And the fun thing about that, I mean, like all the other chapters, you know, like they had been written about, there were books about it, you know, there was a lot of, like a kind of, you know, a, a, a secondary research, you know, like with GM, I had to read the Sloan book and the Peter Drucker book and, right. and like, you know, I mean, all the books about, you know, GM in the eighties, you know, there weren't any books about um, RP share. So, so, you know, I got to go to Carla's office and like to read all the annual, you know, reports and I got to break out the numbers, you know, myself. And, and so that was like the, like the most, you know, primary, uh, primary research. research. Yeah. Yeah, like in the book. And so that was real fun. I like to get to do that stuff. It's a pretty incredible story of of, you know, her having to basically fire her husband and then get divorced. <laughs> like it was yeah. a I mean, I mean like, that's a pretty turbulent turbulent yeah. it was like days of our lives kind of story, you know. Well, it's a it's a good chapter because A, the business is extremely like interesting. Like the history of the business is interesting. Like it does, you know, like it's a great example of how expertise in a business is in some ways more important like than like than than like than patents and IP. And then it was a story about the board of directors, right? Like you had like on paper a very good board of directors, like a bunch of big shots, but they were all beholden to the CEO, Carla's husband. And like, you know, when she began to shake things up and to say, hey, we need to do the right thing, you know, they kind of didn't do it. And she forced their hand. And so that chapter was great to kind of discuss the dynamics of the boardroom and, you know, why corporate governance is like it's so hard. Yeah. So question number four, <laughs> we all see uh, in the headlines these kind of bold activists that are battling with management, you know, and it seems like, um, mm -hmm. you know, these these big battles. But is that really kind of the tip of the iceberg that we're really seeing and that most of the work is actually being done behind the scenes kind of quietly and maybe more constructively? And if you had to guess, what percent would you say is kind of is done behind the scenes versus done in these, you know, headlines and battles? Yeah. I mean, it, it like it does depend on the case. Right. So, you know, there um, are some fights, um, especially like on the on the smaller cap side that. Like, like a pretty much like the shareholder believes that like the board is a flawed board and it's a battle you know from the start and in lots of those cases like it's kind of all out in the open like the first communication is a proc you know like is a you know like it's is a slate of directors you know uh -huh. and, like and those exist but like what you're talking about is for sure the like the norman like like in big business you know today like you know, my book is a lot about like this evolution to, you know, what we've gotten to now where, you know, these big institutions hold like the voting shares in, in um, our biggest uh, public companies. And a lot of shareholder activism is, is about the, uh, the art of uh, persuasion. 
And so that's exactly what's going on. Like when you see, you know, Bill Ackman, um, you know, uh, filing as a 9.9% holder of Chipotle, um, you know, like I, I mean, he's having a, like a meeting behind the scenes, uh, you know, today with a large institutional investor in New York. So it's like a lot of like what he has to do now. Um, it's like it's not just a through the media campaign or a or a direct with like the management campaign. He has to go to Chipotle's big shareholders and prove to them that like he he has the right ideas uh, to drive the company forward. Right. <clears throat> exactly. So what uh, with those big institutional managers that are uh, that are controlling a lot of the the fates of these management companies and and even other more minority uh activists do you th- do you feel like that they're um do you feel like that they're more engaged now than they were maybe say 10 years ago um do you, is there a more of a feeling of an ownership culture uh, yeah than, than maybe 10 20 years ago yeah, I mean, of the of the ones I've seen, I like I think there is, and and I think there's a lot more, you know, a uh, focus on governance, and you know, like for sure, like the firm that um, like that Ackman is meeting, you know, with on Chipotle, um, like they're very engaged and they know the story and like they're smart about it. But at the same time, there is a pressure there. It's like you know, you know, that firm has had lots of layoffs. You know, there's a pressure to kind of, you know, compete with the index funds and like a lot of times the result of that is like, re, you know, reducing like your headcount and, and cutting costs and, and, you know, perhaps, you know, going a little bit more automated. And so, right. Who's left like, to research. The yeah. Company. Like to what extent in 10 years are they going to know, um, at that big institution, like, you know, like what CEOs are, are good and which ones are bad. So it is a thing to worry about. Yeah. I think that's uh, one of the, the unintended consequences of so much, indexing that's taking place these days is yeah. who's when you're when there's a layer between the real owner and and with the, having the index fund be in between you know who's really looking who's minding the store at that point yeah and look i mean like i think to their credit like if you're vanguard like you realize that like you have to mind the store like like if the markets aren't you know like um, aren't you know well credible that is their problem you know you know, I mean, they basically, you know, uh, I mean, they sell the market that like is, you know, they're, you know, like the big interest of, you know, of theirs is that, you know, they have credibility. So, so like it, like it is in their interest, like to do their part on the governance side. Yeah. So question number five, your book is, is really a study of the arc of activism and, you know, starting out with, let's say, Benjamin Graham, which when I read through his letters, it came across to me, if I had to kind of summarize it in a cheeky way, would be, you know, you guys have a lot of extra assets on the balance sheet. Would you mind liquidating them, please? You know, was, <laughs> yeah. and then you get into the 1980s with Carl Icahn and, you know, it's a, it's become more hostile of a takeover, but still, uh, you know, relatively, uh, I'm not going to say calm, but uh, at least professional in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. and then in the you know mid late 90s and you had more like dan Loeb's letters that are they read like a a message board you know with like a flame war where they're just they're very personal attacks on the on the the management a lot of times it seems like maybe it's kind of the pendulum might be swinging back a little bit um from those you know the the most insulting days but uh what's your take on Kind of where is the direction given that arc? Is it kind of coming back, or or are we just sort of in a lull right now, waiting for the next phase of? Uh, of- no, yeah, I, you know, like I think that you have to be uh, careful about well, trying to extrapolate a line there because I do think that ultimately, like you did have that a period of uh, shame-driven activism in the early two thousands, you know, uh, perpetrated by the Dan Loeb's and the Bob Chapmans. And that was a unique time and a moment in history that has passed. And I think that ultimately, you know, uh, once the big institutions decided, like, that hedge fund activism was credible, um, all of that, you know, uh, craziness, you know, was, uh, you know, uh, was uh, counterproductive. And, like, you kind of see that in my book, the last chapter of the book on BKF uh, Capital, which was a total disaster, um, 
like the hostility in the proxy fight, um, I think affected the overall outcome because it uh, created, you know, such hard feelings that the two sides could not, you know, work together when there was uh, like a new board formulated. And so, yeah, I mean, I, like, I do think like that you can point to a, like a long-term decline in decorum, yeah, <laughs> like in yeah. the country. But I think in terms of shareholder activism that like you, you know, uh, shouldn't get, you know, uh, fooled by the head fake of like that well brief uh, period of um of of the shame game you know yeah well that's but, um, yeah that's good probably more productive uh the better for for everybody <laughs> yeah well it's funny i mean i like um like i like directness i was just um you know i remember like when like when like when michael jordan uh gave his hall of fame speech yeah you know for the nba hall of fame and it was this kind of like well, you know, a laundry list of the people in his life that had made him competitive. Yeah. And it got like, well, denounce, you know, he'd had like a little bit to drink and, and it got like well, denounced as like, is like, is this like the end of decorum? But, you know, you know, in our country that like, you know, was, you know, like a rant and not a speech. And, and I guess that like the, the, like that you could extrapolate that to the, like the Trumpism of today, but like to me, I, I mean, I love that Michael Jordan speech. Like I thought it was like, like a perfect, you know, a window into, into his mind and competitiveness. And so like, I do like these like direct and, and honest, you know, letters and like in some ways, like the Benjamin Graham one, like it didn't need to be, you know, well, five pages of, of um, like of pleasantries, you know, wrapped around, you know, uh, three or four cogent points, you know. Yeah, you know. So I mean, like, I don't think it has to go to the, the, the Dan Loeb, you know, level of, you know, we're calling out the CEO's mother, but, <laughs> um, you know, but I like the decline in decorum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I always wondered about with that Michael Jordan speech. I I totally agree. It was an insight into just his. Uh, I don't I was maybe even say pathologically competitive yeah. nature. Um, but I also was wondering if it was almost like he's seeing what he could get away with. Uh, like yeah. even I wondered about his, his like Hitler mustache, like who else could pull that off except for Michael Jordan in this world right now? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny. It's like, like the speech is like supposed to thank the people that got him there. Yeah. And like as a competitor, like he thanked all of the people that he competed against, and so like in a sense, like he gave the true answer. Right. Yeah. So, like, hard <laughs> to blame him for that. Good point. So, bonus question: We always ask everybody, and this is for a book recommendation. What do you sure. got for us today? Well, uh, you know, when I was uh, doing the research on my book, um, I, um, I read like a lot of um, these you know, business histories and and, like in a lot of uh, contemporary accounts of business. And um, in my chapter on the proxy tears, I found this book that had a chapter on a proxy fight and it was called uh, My Life in Court by Louis Neiser. And it was like a massive bestseller. Like, and it was um, um, essentially um, almost a memoir, but these uh, cases from the uh, career of this extremely famous lawyer named Louis Neiser and um, they're very well written. He's a he's a fabulous uh, you know writer, and they're all just um, incredibly you know good stories. And you know this was before lawyers a like lost the ability to write, but but <laughs> but b like before they began like to really specialize. So this guy Lewis Neiser was like like um, he did a divorce case. He did a libel case, he did a music uh, copyright case, and he did a proxy fight, all those things in the same decade, and he wrote about them uh, fantastically, and um, it was just, it was like the one book where like I had to read the one chapter, and I was on a deadline, and I was, you know, trying to write every night, and I just like, I couldn't help it, I had to read the rest of the book. Got sucked into the divorce <laughs> yeah, case. Like, and the... like, it, like it cost me like a week, you know, <laughs> I just got completely sucked in, like, like, um, the music uh, copyright one I read next. And then after I like, read that, I was like, okay, I have to read this whole book. You know, so that one's great. Nice. Yeah, I found the, uh, you know, reading older books, especially from that time period, um, and even just uh, some 
uh, like newspaper reporting. I don't know, just the the snappiness and the crispness of the language is. Yeah. I don't know how we've lost that, and and I don't know if like I wish I could write like that. It, yeah, it, I mean, I mean, like the first thing that would jump to mind is just like the practice, like and and how much these guys wrote. But now with like the new web media thing, there like are people that are churning out just as much content. So, well, maybe we're due for <laughs> for like a renaissance. But um, you know, I mean, I read a lot of John Brooks uh, yeah. for my just because like I mean, like he did a lot on the on the New York Central. He did a lot on the conglomerate tours, and like he's just a wonderful writer. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I, I mean, I don't know how much of this is just that, you know, like there was more interest in in business writing or like if it was just a, a historical accident like you know that that we got john brooks but um but yeah like it did feel like there was a lot of um you know very good business you know while writing back then and and like with gm there's like so many good books on gm and um like you forget that in in the 80s that gm was like you know always a front page news and so there were you know three or four um, excellent books on on gm and toyota in the 80s and then, um, yeah, I mean, like the Alfred Sloan book on GM and the John DeLorean book on GM are both amazing. You know, so, you know, so there's a lot there. Yeah, for sure. Well, Jeff. Uh, Lots of good books. <laughs> yeah, there's lots. There's more books than there is time. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Jeff, I uh, appreciate you coming on the show. And um, everybody pick up a copy of uh, Dear Chairman. It was a fantastic read, really entertaining. And, um, you know, I told Jeff kind of privately that uh, that he's got a great writing voice, and uh, it was I was really impressed with it. Oh well, thank you very much. It was extremely uh, you know well, fun to write the book actually. <laughs> so. Well, great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to Five GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks. Happy reading.